Thanks, Rick. So, okay. So just to remind everyone about the PI3 kinase signaling pathway as a target in B cells. Now, the PI3 kinase enzyme itself is composed of a P85 regulatory subunit shown in orange and a P110 catalytic subunit also shown in orange. And it serves to integrate a variety of signals from the cell surface, including that, those from the B cell receptor, integrin, CXCR4, CD40, and then activates AKT, which leads to a variety of downstream effects on proliferation and survival. Now, the P110 catalytic subunit comes in four different isoforms, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. And alpha and beta are broadly expressed, and their phenotype in knockout mice is embryonic lethal. Delta and gamma have expression-limited leukocytes and a benign knockout animal phenotype, which in the case of delta is primarily focused on B-cell signaling development and survival. Now, adelalisib, formerly known as GS1101, is a highly selective inhibitor of the delta isoform, as shown here in isoform-specific cell-based assays. So there's no activity against alpha, beta. Possibly at very high levels, one can get a little gamma, but you see the cell activity is very high. So in the initial phase one study, which I wasn't sure that we would hear about earlier, but Dr. Sharman did present some data from, the pattern of response that we clearly associate with B-cell receptor pathway inhibitors was very clearly shown, as you can see on the left, where you have very rapid nodal reduction with adelalisib, while at the same time the lymphocyte count rises quite significantly, peaking generally around one month to two, one month one or two, and then declining to some level, which can still be above baseline. And you can see in this, which was the phase one data of 54 patients with CLL, heavily pretreated, the median lymphocyte count 48 weeks after the start of therapy was still about the same as at the start of therapy, even though, as you can see on the right, lymph node response was 81 percent. And so in this study, 39 percent of patients did have resolution of their lymphocyte count down to 50 percent below baseline meaning that they met PR by IWCLL criteria. But another 33 percent met the PR with lymphocytosis criteria from CHESS in 2012 that Rick talked about earlier. And in this study also, there was no evidence that persistence of lymphocytosis was associated with reduced progression-free survival, similar to what has been shown with ibrutinib. Now, the recommended phase two dose from the study was 150 milligrams twice per day, and that was based on a constellation of factors. So on the left, you can see that adelalisib plasma exposure starts to plateau at about 150 milligrams twice per day. And on the right, you can also see that best nodal response also starts to plateau at about 150 milligrams BID. And although definitive dose-limiting toxicities were not seen. It was the impression of many of the investigators that transaminitis might have been a little worse at some of the higher doses. So the combination of those features led to the selection of the 150 milligram BID dose. And the pharmacodynamic effects were seen quite clearly in the phase one study as shown here. You can see at baseline, CLL cells show significant phosphorylation of AKT. This is by a phosphoflow assay and that this is completely inhibited at day 8 and day 28 by adelalisib. Similarly, adelalisib reduces plasma cytokines in CLL patients, including CCL3 and CCL4, which have been pretty extensively studied in B-cell receptor pathway inhibitors trials. Okay. And these are the pivotal data that Dr. Sharman discussed. Just to remind you, adelalisib plus rituximab in relapsed comorbid patients significantly improved progression-free survival compared to placebo rituximab, and also overall survival. So what about upfront? So the phase two single-arm study was presented by Susan O'Brien, and this was a combination of adelalisib 150 milligrams BID with rituximab weekly times eight indefinitely until progressive disease or adverse event. And the patient population was, again, treatment-naive CLL patients requiring therapy, 65 years of age or older. There were no exclusions for cytopenias. Primary endpoint was overall response. So the median age of the patients was 71, and 42 percent had rise stage 3, 4 disease, as shown here. You can see that 14 percent had 17P or P53 mutation nine patients. So in the initial 48 weeks of the study, 
67 percent of patients completed the 48 weeks, while 33 percent did discontinue. This was almost always due to an adverse event, which we'll discuss in more detail. On the extension study, which was for patients to continue therapy beyond 48 weeks, 63% of patients entered and 45% were ongoing at the time of these data analysis. And again, discontinuations were mostly adverse events. Median time on Adele listed was 14.1 months. So this summarizes the adverse event profile. And I've highlighted in red the ones that I think are particularly notable, which we've also already heard about today. So starting at the bottom with the transaminase elevations, in the upfront patients, you can see 23% of patients did have grade three or greater transaminitis. In general, this profile was similar to what we just discussed in the last session, where the drug could be held, patients would resolve, and then the drug could be restarted at the same or lower dose. And this was generally entirely asymptomatic. Pneumonia was pretty common, 17% grade three or greater. And this is always hard to interpret in CLL studies because patients obviously have a high frequency of infectious pneumonias. But I would note that there is probably about a 2% or so rate of a drug-related pneumonitis with adelalisib, which did occur in the upfront study. And there were a couple cases on the phase one study in relapse as well, which is steroid responsive. And so one needs to be alert for this possibility while ruling out infection in the patients and holding drug, and then consideration of steroids if the patients are not getting better with infectious therapy and with ruling out infection. And then diarrhea is the other big issue. You can see over half the patients had some grade diarrhea, and about 23% had grade three or greater diarrhea. And this is sometimes associated with an actual colitis. And again, this colitis is frequently steroid responsive and often budesonide as an oral non-absorbable steroid responsive. But and the other thing to note about the diarrhea is it tends to occur late. The higher grade colitis-like diarrhea tends to occur late at a median of five to seven months into therapy when you may be starting to think that the patient isn't going to have new drug-related symptoms. And so one has to be alert for that too, to jump on it early in these patients. And so here are the serious adverse events. You can see diarrhea, pneumonia, and colitis predominated. And again, adverse events leading to discontinuations. Early on, we have the respiratory disorders and some rashes. And then at later times, diarrhea or colitis starts to come up. And about 40, 45% of the patients on the study did discontinue due to these adverse events. And to some extent, this was because management of the diarrhea and pneumonitis, for example, and the transaminitis were not as clear when these patients were started on trial, and I think now we know better how to manage those, which would facilitate more patients potentially staying on study. So despite the early discontinuations, overall response was extremely high at 97%, and you can see that in the 917P patients, there were three complete responses and six partial responses for 100% overall response. Median time to response was quite quick at 1.9 months, and at the time of this presentation, there was no on-study progression. You can see the very rapid resolution of lymphocyte counts over time. And actually, this reminds me to address a question came through on the iPad in the earlier session that we didn't have a chance to address concerning the rationale for combining the CD20 antibodies with the B cell receptor pathway inhibitors. And, you know, I think a lot of that rationale was really just based on clinical perception that the CD20 antibodies are well tolerated and have been shown to have significant clinical benefit in combination with chemotherapy, for example. Also, the fact that you redistribute CLL cells into the blood, where antibodies can often clear blood but may not work as well on lymph nodes, were all driving forces for the combinations with these antibodies, or combinations with the antibodies. But we don't have a lot of good, sound scientific rationale necessarily for those combinations. But Another feature is that it does clear the blood, which reassured everyone early on when the response criteria were in flux, although we now know that clearing the blood is not really a clinically necessary phenomenon or necessarily associated with clinical benefit, as Rick said earlier. Adelalisib improves cytopenias over time, as do most of the B cell receptor pathway inhibitors, as you can see improvement in hemoglobin and platelets over time in patients who had baseline cytopenias. And this is the progression-free survival curve, which 
we saw earlier as well, which again, despite the early discontinuations for patients, was 93% at 24 months. So very, very potent drug. And at the time, again, of this analysis of the 917P patients, there were not yet any relapses. And we heard that the European label will potentially include upfront 17P patients for treatment with adelolicib rituximab. So in summary, adelolicib with rituximab produces high response rates in upfront CLL. And as with most such regimens, these are mostly partial remissions, but with very good durability. The key side effects of adelolicib, including transaminitis at four to eight weeks, the potentially drug-related pneumonitis, which is a small fraction of the total pneumonia seen, and the late significant diarrhea. It's my perception from these data and clinical experience that these may be increased somewhat relative to patients treated in relapse. And we don't know exactly what causes the phenomena, but there's some perception that they are greater in more highly immune-competent patients. And I should also note that there was a recent paper in Nature looking at the PI3 kinase delta knockout mouse, which showed that, in fact, this decreases T regulatory function and increases effector cell function, which it was studying it mostly in the context of inhibiting solid tumor growth. But it's possible that these immunologic effects may be also involved in some of the toxicities that we're seeing. And in fact, those animals do get a colitis. So open questions, which I'm sure we'll discuss, include the question of do we use adelolicib as a single agent in combination with monoclonal antibodies or with chemoimmunotherapy. Now, adelolicib does not inhibit ADCC in vitro, whereas there are data that abrutinib may actually antagonize ADCC in vitro. So monoclonal antibody combinations for adelolicib may be somewhat more rational than with some of the other agents. And then must therapy be continuous? Currently, it's planned to be continuous. But we saw that many patients discontinue early for adverse events, at least in this upfront setting. So can we better manage the toxicity to allow ongoing therapy or do combinations of more active agents for shorter duration therapy? And then again, what is the long-term toxicity either way? And unlike for brutinib, as yet we don't know the mechanisms of resistance to adelolicib, although we're working fairly hard on it. <laughs> And because, in part, of not knowing those mechanisms, we don't yet know how to salvage those who relapse in a rational way, and we also don't have extensive experience just clinically with how to salvage those who relapse, and we'll be collecting that over the next years. Okay. And thanks to Rick and Susan for their slides. <laughs>